Well, I ended my lecture on realism with this Daumier lithograph. Now, as we move into photography, I want to take up the question that Daumier raised and in some ways mocked in this caricature. Was photography truly an art? Did it threaten to replace traditional art? Before we explore a couple of different answers to that question, let me ask you, do you think photography is an art? And if so, is it as difficult and important or high in art as painting or sculpture? Since the Italian Renaissance, painters had struggled to create an illusion of three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional plane. They employed perspective, chiaroscuro, subtle modulations of color, and by the high baroque, they pretty much had it down. And then along came photography, which could accomplish many of the same feats using light chemicals and one of the Industrial Revolution's infernal machines. Nature could be reproduced close to perfectly. So, did this bring art closer to nature and therefore create a truer art? When I found the quotation you just saw, I got curious and I looked up his work. Della Roche was a very successful French Academy painter who specialized, of course, in large-scale history paintings. So here's an example. Note how carefully he's tried to capture the cloth realistically, but not really any more realistically, I would argue, than Jan van Eyck accomplished in the 1400s. And van Eyck, to my mind, accomplished it a lot more artistically. Here we hear from our friend, the Romantic painter Delacroix. In this quote, at least, he claimed to find photography false for a rather odd reason. A photograph puts in everything without making choices, and the choices are, to his mind, what art is all about. By the way, a realist painter such as Courbet would probably embrace this aspect of photography. Remember that in the Stonebreakers, Courbet avoided creating a focal point. Every detail mattered, and no detail seemed to matter more than the others. Delacroix, as you see, disagreed. And yet, Delacroix was actually one of the first painters to embrace photography as an art and even more as an artist's tool. So here's another quote that I didn't try to fit up on a slide. Quote, as far as I am concerned, I can only say how much I regret such an admirable discovery should have come so late. The possibility of studying such images would have had an influence on me I can only guess at from the usefulness which they have now, even in the little time left for me for more intensive study. It is the tangible proof of nature's own design which we otherwise see only very feebly. I think this is a later quote and shows some change in his attitude to our photography. Delacroix, in fact, formed a collaborative partnership with the photographer Eugène Duroux. Delacroix posed the models, Duroux photographed the models, and Delacroix in turn sketched the models. So here's one example. What do you think? Are these both art? Why or why not? And by the way, the sketches were really the basis for paintings that Delacroix was making. So here's another Delacroix stage photograph. Note the dramatic lighting and the carefully draped cloth. Who is Delacroix channeling here? Hard to miss the similarity to our Odalisque. The painting on the left is also by Angra, by the way. The guy was really into backs. And here is a famous photo of Delacroix by our buddy Nadar next to a Delacroix self-portrait. So what do you think? Which offers more insight into the painter? Actually, I think both works seem to give a window into Delacroix's soul, but in different ways. I would, however, note that initially, photography probably posed the greatest threat to portrait painters. Portrait painting didn't disappear, but it became less photographic and more explicitly painterly. So here's a portrait by one of my favorite American artists, alas, fallen off the list. The detail on the right shows Sargent's debt to Velazquez and his rejection of a photographic style in favor of, remember the term painterly? A painting style that emphasized the act of painting with thick, obvious brushstrokes. And now, alas, I need to get a little technical way out of my comfort zone. We've already talked about the camera obscura and how artists, including Vermeer, used it to help them capture reality and paint, or at least art historians think he did. 
Around the year 1800, Thomas Wedgwood made the first known attempt to capture the image in a camera obscura by means of a light-sensitive substance. Uh, he used paper or white lever treated with silver nitrate. The images produced with this device were very faint, and they didn't last. It was Louis Daguerre, whom we see on the right, who overcame some of the problems and figured out a technique for fixing an image onto a silver surface plate. It was a very complicated and time-consuming process, as this video clip from the Getty Museum will demonstrate. I don't think you need to know all these technical details, and in fact, I've suggested to Ms. Jacobs that she stop after the first three minutes, so you're welcome to watch the rest of it on Moodle. But I want you to have a sense of this process's complexity. You probably do need to know that the process required very long exposure times and that it produced only one non-reproducible image. So it's easy to see from this still life, which is one of our required works, why artists such as Delaroche and Delacroix proclaimed the products of this new technology as art. As you said Delacroix came around to that point of view. Many art photographers still like to work in black and white because of the extraordinary play of light and shadow and the three-dimensional illusionistic modeling that black and white photos create are really better than color photos. But what was the other huge advantage of a still life? Well, these objects didn't have to stand still through the long exposure times. They were blessedly inanimate, unlike people whose portraits were being painted. Note the deliberately simil deliberate similarity to a Dutch Baroque Vanitas painting. This is photography quite clearly trying to imitate art, not so much to capture a moment in time or a particular expression. This tradition lives on, especially in art photography, but it really didn't take full advantage of photography's potential to capture real life. But on with our technology story. After reading early reports of Daguerre's invention, William Henry Fox Talbot succeeded in created, creating stabilized photographic negatives on paper in 1835. And why was that so important? Well, with negatives, you could produce multiple copies. Nadar used the, web collodi the wet collodion process, which means he had to develop his photos up in the balloon because the pictures had to be developed within 10 minutes. No wonder his hat blew off. According to Wikipedia, such a good source, Nadar experienced problems caused by the chemical action on the plates of gas escaping from the balloon, and he eventually overcame these by putting a gas-proof cotton cover over the balloon basket low-tech solution. So here's Nadar's self-portrait, also made using the wet collodion process. And here are a few more of his portraits, including a second and I think much more impish self-portrait there in the middle. Our old friend Courbet looks pretty sad about the state of the world, appropriately for a realist photographer who drew the poor working classes. And look at the way the camera captures the folds and the sheen and even the texture of Sarah Bernhardt's dress. I think that's a wonderful photograph. Journalists, no surprise, leapt at photography's ability to capture breaking news. The war in Crimea was the first to be recorded photographically, and suddenly a faraway war's bloody battlefields moved into people's homes. This famous photo, it's an American photo, shows an early operation being performed under ether. Note the blurred figure as it betrays the motion during exposure. And also note the vantage point, which is from a gallery above. This aerial view flattens the spatial perspective in a way that intrigued impressionists, so stay tuned. While some photographs were taken in Crimea, as I mentioned, the American Civil War was the first war that was quite thoroughly documented on film. This photo by Timothy O'Sullivan is the most reproduced photograph of the Civil War. Uh, he, by the way, used to be a college board favorite, has fallen off the list. But this one hasn't. I love the story behind this photo. Leland Stanford, railroad magnate and the former governor of California, argued that at some point in a gallop, all four of a horse's feet really did leave the ground. Urban legend has it he wagered $25,000 on the proposition, which was serious money in 1878. Alas, most historians think this was just an embellishment. Anyway, Stanford enlisted the help of a scientist and photographer, Edward Moybridge. Moybridge set up 12 cameras attached to wires, which tripped when the horse crossed them. And here's the result, which proves Stanford's point and helped usher in what 20th century art form? 
cinema. So here's another set of Mybridge photos on the same theme of bodies in motion. While Mybridge had the greatest impact on cinema, painters also tried to capture some of these scenes of repeated movement. None of the following works is still on the list, and they're all from a later period, but I wanted you to see them in the context of Mybridge's work. This one's quite famous, if a little silly. Bala was a futurist. I'll have a little bit more to say about this Italian movement in a future unit. Severini was another futur futurist. Armored Train is a genuinely creepy, I also think brilliant, painting. Severini deeply admired war and war machines. For now, I just want you to note his efforts to capture movement over space and time, and you see two of his paintings here. The futurists love Mybridge's work. This famous painting, Stay Tuned for Cubism, may actually have been in part inspired or based on another Moybridge study, this time an early movie. If you Google the name of this painting, Nude Descending a Staircase, and then go to the Wikipedia site, you can see actual film footage of a nude woman descending a staircase, the Moybridge film. Well, nude women will feature prominently in my final lecture of the unit, so stay tuned for Monet.